Welcome to the Ashby Village Science and Ideas Group. My name is Joe Evinger, and I coordinate this group's events with the help of our co-host and tech, tech expert, Hillary Naylor. All of our members here have very educational and work backgrounds, but we all love science and new ideas. We currently have over 60 members in our group and another 100 on our guest list. We meet via Zoom the second Thursday of every month from 3 p.m., until around 4, 4.30, we have a different guest each month who speaks on a topic related to science and ideas. We rely on our science group members, all Ashby Village members, our invitees, presenters, and others for ideas on new speakers and ways to connect with them. Besides our presentation today, I'm actively recruiting speakers who might speak to us in the coming months. Here are some upcoming speakers and their presentation topics. Everybody seems to be talking about the weather, so we're going to have two presentations on this topic. In June, Dr. Ben Santer, an atmospheric scientist at Lawrence Livermore, will give us a presentation topic uh, concerning global climate change and its system. In July, Joel Pomerantz, a writer and natural history educator, will make a presentation entitled Atmospheric Rivers and California Climate History. In August, Martha Jones, PhD in economics. Uh, she's associate professor at, uh, in the Department of Medicine and Health and Society at Vanderbilt, will speak to us on economic demography and global health. We do not have a present presenter yet for September. If you know someone, please recommend them to me along with their contact information. And we choose to go forward, I would ask that person to then make an introduction via email between the two of us. In October, we also have a presentation coming up on the conservation of vultures in the world. We invite all members to join our group. Others interested in Ashby Village presentations are also welcome. And finally, a commercial Ashby Village is a 501c3 tax exempt nonprofit organization. Hillary will place a link in the Ashby Village uh, of the Ashby Village website in the chat. And I note to our guests, please consider a donation or even joining our organization via a website. Now on to our topic today, everybody likes food. Well, today, Daniel Westcott will speak to us on the topic entitled, Stop Eating Your Children's Lunch, a case for animal-free foods. Daniel is an educator and plant biologist by training, an activist by necessity, and an artist at heart. He earned his doctorate at Berkeley in plant biology. And by the way, special thanks to Sheila McCormick for enabling uh, me to hook up with Daniel. After a long and winding path, Daniel wove together music, literature, agriculture, and food in an effort to make a meaningful impact on our food system. He has been working to connect the dots between molecular biology, plant science, and food for the past two years at Climax Foods. And now I present to you, Daniel Westcott. Welcome, Daniel. Hi, thank you. Um, my biography sounds so much cooler in your dulcet tones. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks to, thank you to Joe and to Hillary for organizing this and to Sheila for connecting me. Um, and I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you all today about a topic that is very near and dear to my heart. It's what I've kind of organized my life's work around postgraduate school. Um, but to get started, I think I will just put some slides up and try and organize the conversation that way. As Joe mentioned, I am happy to be interrupted. Um, if I ramble on for too long without some sort of uh, interaction, I feel that <laughs> either I'm not engaging people well enough or not, you know, or speaking in a way that's too didactic that doesn't encourage engagement. So I, I do not know everything. I have points of views and perspectives, but I expect fully expect those perspectives not to be shared by everyone. And uh, I would much rather encourage debate and, and uh, discussion than to just sort of speak one way. So please do interrupt. I'm happy to, happy to field questions as we go. Okay, so this is a... Uh, you know, intentionally a bit provocative, right? Stop eating your children's lunch as though there's a zero-sum game between um, our dietary choices and the choices of the of our children and grandchildren in the future. And I do think that that has some ring of truth to it, but I'm sure the story is much more complicated. Um, let's see. So this is just a little bit about me. I started my life in Baltimore, uh, where I was born, and then ended up in 
Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where I was educated around a bunch of people who work for the Department of Energy and the labs at the Oak Ridge National Labs. Uh, either you worked for the labs or you worked for people who worked for the labs, which was what my parents did, a, a postal worker and a lawnmower. <laughs> and then uh, after graduating from high school, I went to Chattanooga, Tennessee for a while, where I learned a lot about you know hanging out with friends and playing music and making good social connections but i didn't get very educated there i went for a couple of years in physics and then decided that i would much rather play music <laughs> so about uh, 10 years later actually during my time in chattanooga it was very meaningful for me because i was able to actually work on a farm for you know a, a good while there and i learned a lot about how we interact with our food system from a personal perspective so i was part of a, a place called williams island farm and our goal was to sort of bring farming to the community uh, in our in our town. So it was a community supported agriculture model where we we grew and sold direct to consumers. Uh, after that, I moved to Chicago, where I studied to get my education degree, fully thinking I was going to be a, a high school science teacher, where I was uh, doing my student teaching at Oak Park and River Forest High uh, on the outskirts of Chicago. But I was quite distracted by the research opportunities that were presented during my education. So there I worked um, at my school, which was Northeastern Illinois University, to look at the crystal structure of a bacteriophytochrome. Long way to say that it's just a protein that was light sensitive, and we were trying to understand um, what made it so interesting. Then I took a long, long trip and came to Berkeley, where I studied at uh, UC Berkeley to get my plant biology degree, specifically in photosynthesis. And this is where I have some run in with uh, the eminent Sheila McCormick, McCormick here. And I, I studied photosynthesis in the lab of Chris Neogi, where I was able to focus a lot on, on one one problem and really dig into the details, which is a luxury that I feel very, very lucky to have had. It isn't every person that has the opportunity to really dig into one topic and have the have the space and time to try and understand it as fully as possible. And that was that was a great treat for me. Uh, after leaving that, I went straight to Climax Foods. So I graduated in uh, the end of 2019 and into 2020, at which point I just went straight into the workforce and I've been working at Climax Foods since then. Uh, right. So um, a couple other things I didn't mention is that I'm super motivated to preserve the environment for everybody. Um, and then uh, let me check the chat. Are there questions coming through? No. Okay, good. Um, and then uh, just gen my favorite author is Kim Stanley Robinson. If you haven't read Kim Stanley Robinson, I would strongly suggest it. He's, uh, he's fantastic on these topics and really brings geography to life. Okay. So I want to just mention that climate change is the most disruptive force on the planet. This is a little video that I feel like um, maybe I'll have to switch to play it, or maybe it will not play, and that's okay too. Hmm. Anyhow, um, it's a it's a demonstration of how climate, how the uh, surface temperature of the Earth had been pretty pretty steady for the la since uh, the last ice age, and only recently had really has really gotten to perk up a bit due to anthropogenic uh, carbon CO2 emissions, right? So this is a, a snapshot here of what it looks like now. This is emissions of CO2 by country, and CO2 is only one type of greenhouse gas emission causing global warming, but China's going up, US and Europe thankfully are going down. If you were to actually put this into a per capita state though, you would see that US, uh, the US is the top of the food chain as far as per person carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. Additionally, coastal areas are super sensitive to this. So there's a there's a viewer where you can you can sort of see what the worst case scenarios and the best case scenarios of global warming and the impact on sea level rise would be. And it really, really causes a lot of problems along the coast where uh, somewhere around 45% of the US population lives. We seem to like the ocean, right? And that it's going to cause some serious problems in our neighborhood here, right? So this is a worst case scenario if nothing happens in the next, you know, over the next 20, 30 years, if we don't begin to reduce emissions, we are on track to see Marina, uh, the Marina Bay community uh, inundated, Emeryville basically flooded, Alameda becomes an island, uh, the Embarcadero is um, underwater. So there's there's real reason to to think that we should, we should 
uh, change the emissions that we are uh, putting into the atmosphere in order to mitigate these scenarios. So one thing that I wanted to focus on, because this is, this is a talk about food and not about climate change, is that food is a contributor to greenhouse gas emissions. So in, in this case, and this is from a, a wonderful website called Our World in Data, where they crunch a lot of numbers. And if you've ever got any free time, I would suggest you go poke around. But greenhouse gas emissions from food in general is about 26% of total greenhouse gas emissions on the planet. That is equivalent to the transportation sector almost, right? I think the transportation sector is about a third of total emissions. So if 26% of greenhouse gas emissions come from food, what is that about? Growing food is a carbon fixation process, not necessarily a carbon emission process. So if you're, if you're doing that, you're doing something wrong. Well, what's actually happening is that animal agriculture is a very, very large contributor to that 26%. So 90% of our, our uh, greenhouse gas emissions of that 26% of food come from animal agriculture, with beef being the most significant contributor. So this means that we're trading in carbon sequestration for beef. And in the example of Brazil, I've circled in pink here, the region of the state of Amazon or the state of Amazonas. And if you look at this top map, these are colored, the darker color is proportional to an increase in cattle population. And to increase cattle population in the state of Amazonia means that you have to cut down trees to provide grazing land. And if you look at the annual CO2 emissions from Brazil, for example, the largest possible contributor here is beef. And it's because we're cutting down the Amazon, literally trading it for grazing land for beef. I don't think that's a good idea to have 23% of all global greenhouse gas emissions coming from animal agriculture. It seems like there's something we can do practically to reduce the emissions and, and actually something that each person is very, very intimately connected with. Dietary choices are one of the few personal acts you, you can make to contribute in a way that would have a collective impact. But I like to continue to ask the questions like, so what? So, so maybe I posed a problem here. I put this in the context of the climate, but none of us live in Brazil. We're probably not cattle farmers, right? So, so what? Well, I just wanna suggest that we're relying on a really, really terrible factory to supply our food. This factory wastes 60 to 70% of the raw material put into it and then can convert about 30 of that, 30 to 40% of that into almost the same thing. Not the same thing, right? But you put, you put food into a cow, you get food out of a cow. Why not just eat the food? We know from biology that trophic levels, as, as you put energy in, about 10% of that energy goes to growth, the rest goes to waste and heat. It in occupies increasing lands and prevents natural carbon sequestration, directly polluting methane into the atmosphere, which is a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide, although shorter lived. And in order to be profitable, the dairy and cattle industry relies on taxpayer subsidies. Just last month, the Biden administration uh, put 23 to 20, I think it was $23 million from the farm bill to increase slaughterhouse capacity in the states. This same uh, luxury is not being put on all industries. So the simple thing here is that cattle production loses a lot of input to food waste. And you get a, a, a terrible efficiency problem there. But people are like, well, why don't they just eat grass? You know, They're grazing on natural land. That land is not arable. You're not growing crops on that land anyway. Uh, well, 97% of beef cows, that's almost all the cows, are finished at feedlots. Maybe not their entire life, but at least all of them go through feedlots for the last leg of their life in which they're fed corn, and then they're slaughtered. And some animals, you know, cattle is just one example, but pigs spend their entire life in a feedlot in confined areas where they're fed, uh, where they're fed crops that we could directly eat. So from biology class, I remember... Uh, <laughs> I remember learning about trophic levels and knowing that as you go up this chain of complexity in the food web, you have a primary producer, secondary and, and tertiary pr producers, and each level you go up, a ground squirrel will have to eat a lot more grass to put on, like say they eat 100 grams of grass and they put on 10 grams of weight, an eagle will have to eat 100 grams of mass. So as you go up this chain, 
you lose efficiencies to respiration and heat and waste. So here's a couple of questions for the room and I'll give some wait time here to, to see if anyone has any responses. Uh, the first question being, how much energy is lost as we go up trophic levels? I may have given that away. Uh, how many pounds of food is necessary to produce one pound of beef? And then how many gallons of water is necessary to produce one pound of beef? Shall we, uh, Hillary, go to questions first? I see a couple of items in the chat box. Sure, they're, they're not answers to the question, but um, there was a, co a comment from Roger first. Did you want to make a comment, Roger, or el oh, elaborate um, a bit? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so I... Um... I was just asking about photosynthesis since that's your specialty. Um, All right. And I was wondering if uh, if algae and plants are from one origin or did one uh, evolve from the other or would algae be um, uh, helpful in uh, sequestration? Uh, yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> so I, I've got to dig back in my brain a bit and, and maybe Sheila can chime in if she remembers better than I do, but there was many events where uh, free living cyanobacteria was engulfed by a neighbor cell that was trying to eat it. That was sort of the, the, the progenitor of an algae where you have a cyanobacteria that knew how to fix carbon from sunlight and, and take that sunlight energy and use it to capture carbon. And then a, a cell was trying to eat it and didn't actually digest it, but, but actually found that it could use the energy for some amount of time. So actually benefit from the, from the energy that was being fixed by the bacteria. And this was called like, our, oh man, primary endisotosis. I can't remember, there's, there's, a, there's a word for it, but, but it, it captures that first, the first uh, cyanobacteria. And this happened multiple times throughout evolutionary history. There's many events, if you look back through the genetic history of things where this happened, uh, I can't remember the number of times, but it's, it's more, than, more than four. Um, and then that, that's sort of where you get your simple algae, your single-celled al algae that has a chloroplast, which was that original free-living uh, cyanobacteria, and then the other re the rest of the animal cell uh, around it. So you basically have two animals living in one until they sort of merge their genomes um, to some extent. There's actually genetic material in that original uh, cyanobacteria that leaves the cyanobacteria and is integrated into the DNA of its host to where they're, they become dependent upon one another over evolutionary history. Um, so those are the progenitors of plants. Yes. So th there's that that would be sort of your simple cell, and then they learn to organize themselves into multicellular. Learn is the is sort of anthropomorphic here, but they organize themselves over time into a, a more complex multicellular organism because there's some benefits to having colonies against the environment uh, and, and some niches that they can fit when they have multiple cells together, and that would be the progenitor of plants. And as far as carbon sequestration goes, the ocean actually is one of the largest carbon sinks on the planet, or the largest carbon sinks on the planet. And a lot of that has to do with the uh, the phytoplankton and the algae that are in the ocean. Uh, Alan, Alan also had a comment or question. Uh, well, I changed my comment or question because I'm most concerned with the non-nutritional aspects of eating. We don't choose our food from a bank, all food is not alike, all people are not alike. You have differences in food choice, even within a given family, let alone different cultures and different agricultural availabilities. That opens up a, a, a bigger uh, field than you may want to take. But that's the impression that I get and I'm concerned. No, I certainly do want to talk about that. If you don't mind, I do have, I kind of lead us to that, into that conversation a little later. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. All right. So who wants to try, uh, I was going to try to make a guess, Daniel. Oh, sorry, I jumped. <laughs> I'd say 90% would be the answer to the first one. <laughs> that, that's right. It's, a, it's about 90%. <laughs> And then as far as uh, producing one pound of food, it depends on the what they call the feed conversion ratio of the animal. But in, in beef, it's about six pounds in, one pound out. And then water is just atrocious. And this also includes the water to grow, so the irrigation of the cropland. But about 1,800 gallons of water go to one pound of beef, which is, if you think of all the burgers that are sold every day, is kind of atrocious, especially in a drought-ridden uh, 
environment like like California uh, up until this year, obviously. <laughs> so, so I wanted to, to tell you that like cattle and beef are not only directly emitting, but they are preventing sort of regrowth and carbon sequestration through sort of the rewilding of those of those wildlands that we have decided to occupy for support of human human growth and civilization. Uh, I've drawn a little circle around here of the brown cropland. And if it's true that one third of crops go to feeding the, so, so, so one of the arguments that I'm trying to get at here is that a lot of this land is non-arable, right? It, these are plains land. They traditionally had bison or, or other large hoofed beasts and that was, they were vital to the environment there and I actually grew and, and thrived so much so that entire civilizations and the indigenous communities could, could live off of those herds. But now, you know, we sort of replace them by boxing out people and, and we butt up against these greenish areas, which are forest land with our cropland and much of this cropland, about 33 percent or so. And I've kind of made a, a rough approximation, <laughs> you know, the size, the size of a few Midwestern states is given over to feeding, uh, is given over to feeding those animals. Were we to let that cropland go back to fix carbon through the growth of trees and other natural biomes, then you can imagine that carbon is stuck. It is no longer in the atmosphere because it's been fixed through photosynthesis and, and is pulling down through natural means the amount of carbon that's contributing to greenhouse gas. So there's a direct effect of cows, of, of cows actually uh, releasing methane through their digestion into the atmosphere, but also an indirect effect by them blocking potential solutions through to carbon sequestration through the need of increased cropland to feed them. Uh, here's a, here's a said in scientific terms. So uh, shifts in global food production to plant-based diets by 2050 could lead to sequestration of 332 to 547 gigatons of CO2, which is equivalent to on a hundred percent of the emissions budget, right? That we've given ourselves if we want to hit targets to stay below 1.5 C rise in global climate change. So that's saying pretty clearly that you know, this ambitious idea that we stop eating animals uh, in service of the climate could give us enough running room to, to build the technology and the solutions to prevent a catastrophic rise in, in temperature that will result in mass migrations, displacement of humans, uh, entire, entire disruptions to the world that we know. So here's the premise that I'm trying to, to really hammer home is that producing food using animals generates excess greenhouse gases directly and blocks carbon sequestration indirectly. It's sort of a, a, you get a, by removing them from the system, you get sort of a twofer. But again, so what, right? What are we gonna do? We're we gonna expect everybody to just listen to a talk like this and then say, that's, that's what I think. Because I think what uh, Alan was suggesting is that it's more complicated. So I'm proposing very simple, so simplistic view here that animal agriculture is not sustainable and a significant contributor to irreversible damage in the ecosystem. And so my solution is let's decommission the factory, right? Let's remove the animal agriculture from the system, but, but it, it's not so simple, right? Food is culture, comfort, tradition, and also big business, right? There's many entrenched businesses in the food system, right? This is a, a family eating, right? We organize ourselves around meals. It's very important to us. Nutrition is critical to our health. It's not so simple. So of these two cheeses, one of them is non-dairy. Would anyone like to venture a guess? I'll hold my cursor over this one. You can say either that one or not that one. Hmm. Looks pretty difficult to tell the difference. <laughs> right, so one of these cheeses is ours and I apologize for the quality of the photo. This is, this is a blue cheese that we've made here in our company, um, Pimax Foods, and this is a dairy. And the differences to taste, texture, nutrition, and flavor are almost imperceptible. If you ate them one after another, there's a little bit more umami that you get out of the dairy than we get, but we're working on it. Uh, other than that, if it was on a cheese plate mixed in with other dairy cheeses that were not blue, you wouldn't notice for a moment. And, and so I'm, I, I'm suggesting that there are ways to make switching easier to facilitate this, right? You have to meet some very important targets. It has to taste as good or better than animal-based com uh, comparisons. It's got to feel right in the mouth. It has to cost less or the same as animal-based product. 
and it has to support health and nutrition. And you cannot try to displace tradition and culture. So food should not be the realm of culture wars. And any of us who are trying to provide solutions like this, who get into sort of a dogmatic approach of, of we're right, you're wrong, will get lost into the world of culture wars and will never actually be able to move things forward. So how do you do that is sort of my question. And, and I'm trying to work by helping to build this company called Climax Foods, where we are, we are making cheeses in service of these goals that I've been. Daniel, it looks like we're getting a number of items in the chat room. Sure, I'll take a, I'll take a moment. So Great. Hillary, do you want to leave, uh, take them in order? Uh, where to find the coastal flood map? I, I can right. uh, link to that in the chat, I think. You'll give me just a moment. That'd be great. Thank you. I think that's hey, and then uh, both uh, Joan and Susan are asking uh, similar questions about protein. How are we going to get enough protein uh, from the plants? I, I'm really glad you're asking. I am the head of protein and texture at Climax Foods. <laughs> protein is my short of evil. <laughs> it's what I focus on every day. Let's see if I can get back to the chat here. So the sea level rise viewer is from NOAA, NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And I've put a link to that in the chat. And so though some plants have some protein, plants are not generally an efficient source of protein for humans. How in the world can we feasibly get 60 plus grams of protein per day, which is what at least older people are said to require? That's a good question and it matters. Um, I will say that cows are bigger than me <laughs> and they also get their necessary protein out of plants uh, from, from grazing. That, that's a little bit trite, but, but what I'm suggesting is that, that the protein is there. It's just that there's lots and lots of other stuff in the way. So, so I'm working to actually uh, isolate proteins in a systematic way and make sure that they are providing adequate nutrition to us. Going back to here, all right. Can we see the slides again? Yeah. Yes. Okay, good. Yeah, so um, I can address the protein uh, a little bit more later. I, I left a slide to talk specifically about protein, but um, yeah, so let me hold on that for a second. And if I don't answer your questions, then please feel free to come back and we'll talk more about it. So, so in general, how are we going to provide solutions that meet the moment? Uh, and, and, and again, I'm talking about cost, texture, nutrition, and flavor, right, and taste. So for, for our work here, we run through a series of steps. And I'm, I'm just going to walk through them. And if if they don't make sense, please feel free to stop. But our, our first step is to find the cheese that we want to make, right? So we are lucky enough to be located in Berkeley and we work right next to the Berkeley Bowl. So I can go and pick the best cheese that I want. And then I can take it back to the lab and basically measure it in as many ways as I can derive. So I call this a, a comprehensive understanding, but there's always gonna be gaps. Uh, food is very, very complex. But then we start making things, right? It, it might not be perfect. It might be way off to make our first recipe, but we've got ideas. Uh, and then we measure them in the same way that we measured our dairy targets and compare. And, and then I adjust and then we repeat, right? So this is a build, test, learn cycle where we're trying our best to minimize the differences between our products and dairy products. And, and those differences need to take into account nutrition, texture, flavor, and cost. And if we miss those marks, then we have to stop and try again. So here's an example. So dairy is generally composed of four major molecules, fats, proteins, salts, and sugars. So butters are fat. Our proteins are curds and whey in dairy. The sugars often are, are lactose and the salts are usually calcium phosphate. Um, our, our, our cheeses actually don't have lactose. So there is an advantage that we are not getting into lactose intolerance and are actually able to make a food that's more edible by more people. But uh, it's here just as an example. And if we want to focus on, uh, on making our best dairy analog, we have to take into account each one of these uh, components in its, in its sort of isolation and then in its context in a cheese. And can I say a word that nobody likes yet? I want to see if it's, uh, I'll, I'm going to market test this on you as a group, as the first external people. <laughs> you, you know the words in vitro mean in glass. 
in vivo means in life, in queso means in cheese. So I do a lot of my experiments in queso just to see how these molecules act in, in context. But that in queso, I think, is, is too cheesy for, for most people. <laughs> but I like it. <laughs> OK, so, so this is some data that I'm just showing you that we've derived here. And, and this is from something called a differential scanning calorimeter. And basically what it does is I take take a sample and I put it into little bitty crucibles and I heat it next to an empty crucible. And in that crucible, as it heats and as the material within it goes through phase changes, there's either an, an, a need for additional energy to get over that phase change or it releases energy into the system. So it's measuring the difference between, so the differential, the empty and the full is measuring the difference there. And the calorimetry, it's showing sort of the heat flow, whether it goes in and out. In more simple terms, this is just uh, some coconut oil put in a little cup and heat it up. And as it heats up, you see this melting curve. As it begins to get past freezing, it starts to get softer. It starts to get softer, at which point it completely melts. And all the energy that was left in this coconut fat is lost. And now it's a coconut oil. So this is the transition of melting in coconut oil. Similarly, this is the transition of melting in ghee, which is a dairy-based fat. It's more complicated. It's got more going on because there's different fats there. It's got a, it's got one melt peak and this long broad melt peak here. And this is really important from 20 to 40 C or so is about the temperature that you'll be experiencing when you go from room temperature to the temperature of your body. If you put cheese in your mouth, this is sort of the melting part of ghee and of dairy fats. That's gonna be critical of softening and giving you a mouthfeel that's pleasant and, and you're used to. And if we use coconut oil, which doesn't have anything going on between about 23 and, and beyond that, you can't expect to have a similar mouthfeel. So, so for us, it's really important to start to start from the molecular fundamentals of how cheese is built or put together and treat it like a material and see how we can reverse engineer that as well as possible. But since coconut oil doesn't do it, what are we gonna use to do it? We decided to try and start mixing together as many things as possible. So, this is an example of how if we if we blend things together, we might change the melting curve of those oils. And what we did was actually tried we we used a statistical model called Bayesian optimization. And Bayes is a is a old school monk who was also a statistician, early days statistician. And it, it's not so distribution based statistics. It's an interesting approach. But but the short story is that we threw a lot of things into the system and measured them against our target. And this, at the very bottom of this, you can see these differences. This is the two curves subtracted from one another. And that's what we're trying to minimize. If this was this little line at the bottom was flat, it would mean that these two, two curves completely overlapped. So we ran through you know, probably a couple, uh, upwards of 400 examples of mixtures of fats this time. And each time you just get a little closer, you try again, you try again, and you begin to try and minimize the differences between your ghee target, in our case, and the, and the blends that we get in order to get this, this melting curve that goes between 20 Celsius and about 38 or 40 Celsius, so that when you put it in your mouth, it melts much more uh, realistically or much more like a dairy that you're used to. And again, all of this is in service of trying to make, make the most convincing dairy analog possible so that when you're asking people to, you know, change their diets and, and eat an unfamiliar food, it's not going to be unfamiliar in, in their actual sensory uh, experience. Okay, so proteins. <laughs> so dairy proteins are magic and cheese itself has uh, somewhere around anywhere between 18 to 23% protein. I've been a vegetarian since 1998 and I would not have been able to make it if I didn't eat cheese. It's been my <laughs> steady protein source for a long, long time. And I don't think that, um, we can expect people to go and eat lots of protein powder in service of this greater good goal. We're trying to leverage sort of a little bit of altruism, but also uh, the, the altruism built into individuals, but also make it as easy as possible. So this stretching pr uh, property of dairy cheese has, to, uh, has everything to do with the protein that's in dairy, which is called casein. And it's, this, it's an intrinsically disordered protein. It just means it's got no reliable shape or structure. If you go and pull out an individual, it's just a big blob. And as it's heated up and melted, it also has no like 
it doesn't lock into any one position. And so it's able to sort of stretch and slide past each other, but it has enough cohesiveness to where it doesn't completely fall apart. And it's a unique protein that's sort of, um, it's unique to mammalian organisms. And I think of it as a, a nutrient delivery molecule. So casein holds a lot of calcium for early bone growth in infants, a lot of protein for conversion to amino acids to be able to be supportive of their new growth. Um, it also, you know, has uh, fats that are necessary for energy. So it's a nutrient delivery molecule. And when we think about the nutrient delivery molecule of plants, well, that's a seed, right? And seeds are meant to be desiccation tolerant. They can get dried and rehydrated and then grow, whereas milk is almost never dried. And then when you, when you eat milk as a baby, it goes into your gut, into an acidic place, at which point it curdles, right? It, it firms up and it isn't immediately off down through the uh, alimentary canal, it slows down, allowing for a slower and more steady digestion for that to be broken down. And that happened over evolutionary time. And what we see as a result of it is this stretchy cheese. You know, we, we like this property, but really it serves an evolutionary purpose in the growth of an infant and a mammalian infant. And to expect plant proteins to do the same thing um, is, is not, not intuitively going to work. And so a lot, a lot, a lot of effort and money has been spent on trying to make this magical, magical molecule called casein in yeast. Um, you may or may not have heard of uh, precision fermentation or what companies like Perfect Day are trying to do, but they're, they're using yeast in the, in the way that you would uh, raise yeast to produce insulin. Instead of producing insulin, they're trying to produce a different protein called casein and then extract that casein from the yeast and use that to make cheese. Turns out this is kind of hard. Um, people have spent many, 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 many millions of dollars on it, like in the $400 million mark. And the challenge is that getting it out of the yeast without tasting bad seems to be pretty tough. <laughs> so in order to get this to work, we're interested in trying to survey plant-based cheeses. But hopefully this plays. Hmm. An error occurred, error five. Uh, what I'm showing you here is a, an example of plant-based cheeses that are made with mostly starch. And almost all of them that you can buy on the market, with a very rare exception, are a mixture of starches, potato starches, corn starches, and coconut oil. And when you melt those, you should not be surprised that they do not behave like protein, right? It's, it's starch, they go bleh. They turn into a goo and not into a stretch. But I am here to tell you that plant-based proteins can stretch, and it's just a matter of learning which ones do what, right? So part of our part of our mission is to discover which proteins are the most magic. And this is Avinash, one of my colleagues, who, who has discovered this property of stretch in a plant-based protein. And, and what it requires is that you're just a little bit more careful in your protein isolation. So for us, it's it's um it's not an insurmountable problem. We don't need to invoke fermentation in order to create a protein that will have the textural properties of dairy casein. And also it comes straight from a plant. So we're jumping over the entire animal agricultural system. We just grow, can grow the plant, grind the seed, pull the protein out. Why this particular seed has a, the capacity to stretch while other particular seeds do not has to do with the surface characteristics of these proteins. And it gets complicated fast and I, I do not fully understand it. But we're working on it because as soon as we understand the mechanism of why this one does it and other ones do not, will allow us to reach further out into different plants and optimize for things like nutrition and cost. Um, as was said by, I, I think Hillary, uh, that not all food is the same and not all proteins are equally nutritious. So it's really important to us to make sure that people are getting a complete, uh, complete nutritional profile in the foods that we eat. Yes, we do have a couple of questions around nutritional sure. um, values and um, comparing the, uh, the plant-based cheese with the animal-based cheese regarding calories. Susan, do you want to ask your question? It's actually partly a comment, I guess, but you know, the food industry bought us brought us Doritos and they call that food. Yeah. So I I would really like to see a lot more integrated discussion in your work about nutrition. Yep. And um and how the 
the real cheese compares to the cheese, you know, it, the, the texture is very nice. And I know that's important. And I know flavor is important, but nutrition is important to me too. Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it has to be. Like when I grew up in Tennessee and I decided to become vegetarian, I was still going to my church uh, potlucks and I was only able to eat potato chips on buns, right? This is not a nutrition <laughs> diet. I can't, I, I was changing my diet because of what I felt like was a, a ethical and moral choice for myself to sort of help to preserve the planet for other people. But you know, that's a, that can't, you can't expect people to adopt potato chips <laughs> on a, on a bun, right? You, you absolutely have to make the food nutritious. And where we're different than many food science companies and food companies is that we actually are, none of us are food scientists. There's, there's a few of us, right? And we, none of us, none of us come from the Kraft Heinz of the world, the Nabiscos of the world. And I've learned a lot about how those industries work. They basically get um, they get one product on the shelf and if it's good enough and people continue to buy it, they don't change it. And if they do change it, they make a different flavor, right? The, their incentive is to continue the revenue coming to their con company, right? Mm -hmm. Our incentive is different. Our incentive is to really push the, the ball forward because we're a series B corp, right? Our, we're committed to the public good. And we're also, you know, really, really concerned that if we don't hit nutritional targets, we won't be broadly adopted. Right, so so we do measure and try and understand the protein content, the fat content. We can actually reduce saturated fats since we're not using dairy um, dairy fats. Right, we have the option to actually make a more nutritious product, as long as we can do it without sacrificing those other important pillars of the of the mission, which are taste, texture, and cost. So and protein. Well, yeah, yeah. So uh, protein. I'm sorry that I'm not being more explicit about this. Protein to, to me is implied. Because we will not, we will not put a product on the market that does not have a high protein content. Uh, dairy has about 23% protein or so. Some of them are about 18, depending on sort of your fat content and moisture content. It goes from about 18 to 23% protein uh, in in the material. In our cases, oh, oh, and this is one of the challenges, right? So in plant-based cheeses, if if you get commercially available protein off the shelf and you put it into your formulation, it tastes terrible. There's a, there's a method of protein isolation that's adopted uh, at a commercial scale in most manufacturing plants that almost, to put it, to put it uh, simply, kind of scrambles the egg, right? Eggs are mostly protein. And, and when the egg is heated, those proteins come apart and are denatured, and they never go back to their native form, right? So you have an egg that becomes cooked and, and doesn't ever go back to its native form. Let's imagine if you cook that egg and then grind it in a mill into a powder, that's the protein powder that's sold. That's an oversimplification, but the isolation process at the manufacturing level leaves those proteins um, sort of beat up in a way that they're never actually going to provide structure and an interesting taste because they've been killed on the way out. So a really, really big part of my work has been optimizing how we get proteins out without denaturing them or causing them to, to lose their native shape. And what you get out of that is a a much more taste neutral. You can put a lot more protein into your product without sacrificing flavor. And then you get these textural properties that are reliant on the molecular structure. If you cook it up and grind it, basically, then your structure is dead. You're, you're trying to build a house with mud instead of bricks, right? You, you, you no longer have interesting structure. And, and, and the structure is actually, for example, in cheese, it can't melt and it can't stretch you can't have something deform if it was never formed, right? So, so when you use proteins, commercially available proteins uh, in your formulation, which is what many, many producers have tried to do, they fall flat. And I've got this next picture of baby bell, all right? Um, bell Cheeses is about a 110-year-old family-owned company with a factory on every continent in the planet. They sell $2 billion worth of cheese every year. It's phenomenal how big this company is. And this is their plant-based cheese and it's starch and coconut oil, you know, and it, it shouldn't be terribly surprising that, that the, you know, a, a dairy conglomerate isn't putting out the best non-dairy cheeses, right? That's probably not their, their incentives aren't that aligned, but unusually they're currently run by a CEO who cares and who actually finds this to be mission critical. And over the next 10 years, they're working very, very hard to reduce and eliminate dairy in their products. And they've come to us and they said, will you partner with us 
and be our research and development arm to help improve these non-dairy products. So this is our first target with Bell. And our first goal is to increase the protein level. So their current protein level is zero. So it's not gonna be hard, <laughs> but, but our goal is to make it equivalent with dairy, which would put us up into the 18% or so. Right now we're at a really nice formula with somewhere about 15 or 16%. As we get up closer to that, that, that dairy equivalency, you get some off, off textures and we have to sort of solve that last, you know, that last 20% of our goals. Uh, and we haven't exactly gotten there yet. We've definitely met Bell's expectation, right? Baby Bell has, um, they're like, oh, we want something with 3%, 4% protein. And we're like, we, we did that like two years ago, right? <laughs> it's not really a big deal, but we wanna, we wanna make it as, as close to dairy and even better if possible, so that you know, we are making, making sure that we're providing nutritionally equivalent healthy foods rather than the next Dorito. Okay, so that kind of brings me full circle to uh, where I'm at now. And I, I hope that I'm not going too short. Uh, where are we, what time, what time is it? Oh, 3.53, okay, we're okay. Um, so we are continuing to hire, if you ha know any bright scientists or people who are motivated to make food and to try and make an impact, uh, we are hiring. Uh, I am in charge of hiring people. It's very strange to be in that position. I've always been, <laughs> I've ne never been a boss and now I'm a boss, <laughs> but, but that's true. And, and now I just kind of want to open it up. If people have, uh, want to have time for an open discussion about these topics, I I'd be happy to talk more. Yeah, Matt, hey, Matt, Alan has a comment. Maybe he'd like to put this forward. Well, I have lots of comments, sure. but certainly. Uh, more respect than I expected to have. <laughs> <clears throat> and uh, uh, one that, manuf that may be relevant is people don't know, and I think larger amounts of people, Berkeley is not a, a good cross-section of either, the, and, and I'm sure you know that, the U.S. Uh, or, it, it, or even the Western world, uh, that don't know and don't care how much of what is in there. Uh, but I think you know the things that I'm going to say. The tradition counts, cost counts, and you listed them at the beginning. Uh, most nutrition in people doesn't come from their cheese. It right. comes from, from uh, grains, and that has been the case in history. Uh, I'm not sure, and grains contain of, of something like 8 to 12% protein, and that's the function of the Green Revolution. And a lot of attention has been paid. All proteins are not the same, Correct. but to the buyer that doesn't care, uh, you can use the word. And the word has a, uh, I, I, I won't use the word magical because I'm very anti-magical, but it has an important influence on the buyer. He thinks or they think that it's good to have more. And you'll, what you're doing may well sell. And I, I agree with you. But it's not going to solve the grass and the agriculture problem. Uh, and you know, there's other things like any leaves that fall, any grass that spoils, puts the CO2 back, and the importance of the OCO2 in the ocean. And methane does not dissolve in water, and CO2 does. There's many issues that get involved here. And yeah. that I don't think that your talk is about, but I'm impressed with what you've done. and that it may work. Yeah, well, some... we certainly have to put this in context of the larger effort, right? We are only one piece of a potential many shoulders on the wheel process, right? I think that if we really want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, it, it needs a wartime effort. And one company, it, we, we have a small part to play, but hopefully can, you know, shift the paradigm away from saying that it's, it's, it's only possible to meet those expectations using animal products. Well, yeah, that's bigger than I think the food question. It's much more a question of changing human demand, which nobody wants to talk about because nobody wants to do. And I understand that too. Yeah, uh, right. It isn't so easy and it may not even be possible. But, uh, it's true. That aside, and uh, yeah. On the topic of not all proteins are the same, it's a, it's a, a, a huge challenge for us, right? Because you, some companies and some people just want to say more protein better. But you can have, for example, you said that grains have about 80 or 8%, 8 to 12% protein, which is true. 
oftentimes that protein does not have a complete amino acid profile, right? Oh, so yeah, and that complicates the matters more and brings up the advantage of soy. And somebody is going to say, but the more popular it is, the more I don't want it. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, uh, well, that, that's, I'm, I'm yeah. avoiding going through all of those doors and trying to stay with what you've done. That's okay. On the traditional side of things, I think that our ultimate goal, and this is ambitious and we may never get there, but the ultimate goal is to provide an ingredient as far upstream in the processing as possible. So a milk, for example, that curdles. Uh, again, we don't want to ship water all across the planet. That seems counterintuitive. But if we can provide an ingredient that could be given to suppliers in order to them in order for them to create cheeses according to their traditions that match the functional properties of current dairy products. Yeah. And, and this is a project we're actually working on so that we can so that we can go as upstream as possible to not be as disruptive to what people expect to see in their traditional markets. I think that would go some ways towards alleviating that traditional concern. Yeah, and uh, I can mention only one additional thing that I'm sure you know about, something like quarter percent, but, but one quarter of the world's population is in China and another quarter doesn't, and that's half rice, half wheat. And all, all of that is, carbon dioxide in the air. Are we nibbling at the corners of the elephant or are we dealing with at least one of the legs? Right, that's a good question. I, I don't. Okay. I, it, um, Sarah has her hand up. Sarah, want to ask your question? Yes, um, I, I'm really intrigued about your the confluence of your background as a musician. Um, I'm also a musician and I'm a big fan of Beyond Burger. Um, for all the reasons it's a good thing. Um, do you have any uh, concerns about Beyond Burger or it's like, and um, how does music uh, keep you sane? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, many a late night when I go home uh, and I just stay up in the garage kind of making music on the computer. It's, it's, it's definitely helpful to have it out. Um, Beyond Burger, Impossible Meat, um, a, a plethora of plant-based products sort of hit the market all at once and, and caused this, this surge. And maybe it was excitement, maybe it was saturation. Uh, it was like definitely investor driven and not necessarily consumer driven, I think. There was some consumer pull, but it was really sort of a push from, from I think, companies and investors. Uh, I think that they are trying to do a Herculean task, right, as well as, as us. Uh, and they're not perfect in all accounts, but man, if you remember the veggie burgers from 20 years ago, I, I definitely <laughs> pleased, right? So for somebody who's already motivated by these issues, I think they're great. If the goal is to provide um, provide healthy and nutritious alternatives to people who are used to eating uh, animal-based diets, maybe they hit the mark for some people, but not, not 100% or broad adoption. I, I don't know what the number is to consider it a success. Uh, I know that they're not completely motivated by nutrition. We get we get back to this discussion where much of their motivations is uh, are, are to sort of again sort of provide an alternative to people that are out there to have the believability or at least better textural and flavor properties than our veggie burgers of the past. But I think that they have to sacrifice. They often sacrifice nutrition in, in order to do that. Um, there's a sodium component as well sure. that is an issue for a lot of people. Um, so, you know, to help make it taste better, not necessarily the Beyond Burger, but just in general, um, is sodium involved in your cheeses at all? Yeah, we use sodium chloride during a pro protein extraction. Sometimes we work to rinse that away. Sometimes we don't. Uh, the level of sodium isn't higher than dairy-based cheeses, but it, it is there. Yeah. And I actually have a colleague, the one that I showed stretching the cheese, Avinash, who worked in, worked on sodium in his PhD, and he really, really, really emphasizes it every day that we need to find better ways to do this. And, and it, it, is, it is on the mind of us to try and reduce the amount of sodium in our products. But... Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Joan, Joan has a question. Uh, yeah, I wanted to um, ask a question about ultra-processed food. Um, it sounds as if you're at best, um, your product would be ultra processed. And uh, aren't we being told that real food is better than ultra processed food? And <laughs> I'm the one who also was skeptical about whether we can get enough protein, even from cheese. So it's very hard to get enough protein. 
um, I've been counting grams of protein in various kinds of foods and even nuts and cheese don't really give as much protein as animal foods and not all animals are equal. So you're, you're condemning beef, which I understand, but maybe fish and, and poultry are not as guilty as beef. Yeah, I, I'm not. I'm not necessarily trying to paint any one any one part of the system any worse than the other. I think that they all could have room for improvement. But you're right that the amino acid profile and the protein content of animal based products is a more complete nutritional profile for humans. Right. Um, the right. way to get around that is complicated, and it's not going to be any one food. Right. So for you to have a complete amino acid profile in your diet, you should not be eating one food and only one food, right? So say you have a high protein, mm -hmm. a high protein food that is lacking in certain amino acids and you focus on that because the number of protein is high, but it's not a complete protein. You may be missing something like lysine or methionine, so, some amino acid that's important for you that you can't make, make inside, right? That you have to ingest. Um, so it's right. And I think Alan mentioned this and I, I, I agree with it that the, the data or the nutritional labels aren't enough information to really make good nutritional choices, right? You have to go a little bit deeper. And, and it sounds like you're doing that, right? By actually reading and, and getting into the research there. For, for us, we have some ingredient choices that work really well for our cheeses. And that's probably where we focus first. And then we need to supplement those ingredient choices because the the function of those proteins might be great, but the uh, don't, don't finish the job, right? And so, so we have to then add proteins from a different source, say a legume or some sort of grain to help comp complete the amino acid profile. The actual numbers, like how much protein per serving won't be that meaningfully different from dairy. And so again, if you can't get uh, you know, enough protein from food one, you have to go to food two. And what those options are, are going to be a, a complex mixture of personal preference, culture, and sort of your your internal motivations. But what about the ultra processing? Ultra oh, right, processing. yeah, right. So I'm actually not doing ultra processed food, right? So, so our food, <laughs> what I'm doing is grinding protein out of seeds. The, you, you can do what I do in the kitchen, right? There's okay. there's some things that we're looking forward to in the future that could probably fall on the borderline there but it would be more along the line of like a protein powder that you would get from GNC than uh, something that you would expect to be extruded through a, through a, a large manufacturing facility. Uh, Jan had a, a question and a comment. Jan, do you want to ask your question? Well, maybe not. Uh, she wanted to know more about the job description and oh, whether sure. you would hire older adults and uh, a comment about up up food um, oh, upside located food. in Emeryville. You know about upside, them? Yes, Upside Foods is interesting. So um, we are a our company is a formulation company. We're trying to put things together in ways that make them more interesting. Um, Upside Foods is a cell culture company. They're trying to grow meat using uh, a lot of the same techniques and technologies you would to grow yeast in a bioreactor. But they're instead of growing yeast cells, they're growing uh, tissue culture of meat that has been made to be immortalized. So, so I'm not sure how many of you read the book, uh, The Secret Life of Henrietta Lacks, where you learned about uh, those immortalized cell lines and how beneficial they were for medical research. Well, people took that technology and said, if it can work in a human, it can work in a, in a mammal of other sorts. And they they focused on beef and they're, they're using that to grow tissues, actual beef tissue, but only on a cellular level and then trying to assemble that into, into a meat product. Yes. And they are, they are going to have a lot more challenges of going from that technology to actually being a product on the shelf because it will require FDA approval, uh, USDA approval, and then consumer adoption, which will all be challenging, I think. And then um, as far as old uh, hiring older people, hey, look at the website. We have job, uh, job openings listed there. Um, feel free to apply. <laughs> we are ready to have people come and help. You know, even if it's even if it becomes something like as simple as sensory panels, right? I think we have a place to sign up for tasting if if you're interested to contribute in that way. We really need people who know food, right? And so, uh, you've had a, a lot of food by this point in your life, I think. <laughs> I saw Sally Curry. You were waving your hand a few minutes ago. Did you have a question? And uh, unmute yourself.
Uh, I was going to ask about the sodium, and it's really already been answered. Yeah, I, I think I, I I think I hear you loud and clear. Um, we are we have a lot of different components together to try and make sure we hit nutritional targets. And sometimes that means deprioritizing one or not putting one at the top of the list, but they probably all need to be, we need specific targets to hit before we even decide that we're gonna bring these to market. And I'll, I actually, I think that what you're doing is reinforcing the need to revisit sodium and talk to Avinash about his history, uh, his PhD work and, and how we can do best to extract these proteins with less sodium. Because we do we use sodium chloride, it, it helps to break the cells open and release the proteins into a solution. Um, and without that, we need some other salts and there are potentially other salts that don't have, have the same problems with sodium. Susan? I, <clears throat> I'm a little hard of hearing and I cannot understand the first word of your company. Oh, Climax Foods. So you, how do you spell it? C-L-I-M-A-X. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I realize that it is a bit of a uh, double entendre. <laughs> Not my choice. <laughs> uh, Daniel, I have a, a little bit of a cynical question for you. Sure. <laughs> uh, I have a good friend who 30 years ago uh, worked with chemists and others and developed a superior uh, kind of soap kind of a competitor of Neutrogena. And, uh, and they started to have some pretty good success. Uh, a big sub company came in and offered them what to my friend was a, a fair price and, in, and then just put them out of business. Yeah. Because they didn't like what they were doing. What are you gonna do to, are you doing to stop that from happening? Yes, it's a good question. Um, our goal, at our goals and our mission alignment of people in the company would be a huge resistance to any move like that. But ultimately, the employees here only have so much say. It mm -hmm. would be the uh, the CEO and the board who would pull the trigger on a deal like that. Um, I do not think that he is the type of per the person, a type of person who would accept a deal from a larger company. And we have been approached by many larger companies who have been interested in our technology with sort of the hint that they are interested enough to buy us out. Um, and that has not gone anywhere because our CEO has not been interested in that. We're number one, we're doing pretty darn good uh, on our own. And we see paths to, you know, we're, we're investor funded right now, but we see paths to revenue very shortly. We're going to be putting blue cheeses out into Michelin, rest, three Michelin starred restaurants over the next two weeks. And then after that, we're working towards a retail launch in the beginning of next year with the blue cheeses and, and other cheeses will follow after that. So I, I think we're in a good position to steady the course. Uh, if that course becomes contentious, I'm, I, I don't know exactly how it will, it will work. I hope we'll, I hope we'll be able to stay strong and, and continue to do the work because as soon as someone were to buy us out, uh, the research and development would be squashed, right? It would be, oh, you did good enough. Let's just make the next Dorito, change the flavor a little bit and provide no real solutions. That's what I was worried about. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Are you, uh, uh, have plans to release any commercial products yet or are you uh, already? Uh, they're not on the shelves yet, but we do have plans to be uh, releasing them in small quantities in the beginning of next year with the ability to scale that up uh, over the course of the next year with we'll have four out by the end of 2024. Berkeley Bowl? Yes. <laughs> you would find them there? Yes, but but again, not probably not not for a little while. Well, what's a little while? Uh, I, I expect sometime around January is oh. when we're going to go for retail. I don't know what stores we'll go to first. It will be a limited run. So Berkeley Bowl is high on the list. Rainbow Grocery, you know, those, those stores where people like to try new things um, will be the first targets. Do we have any other questions uh, at this point? Oh, we have alternative cheese <laughs> names. Gorilla Zola. <laughs> yeah. we, need a, we need a pithy name for a mozzarella. <laughs> we'll work on that. <laughs> sounds good. Sounds have good. it end in Ella. Yeah, <laughs> sounds good. <laughs> <laughs>
Pissarella. There you go. All right. There you go. See, I have a whole new job job title yeah, here. That was yeah. free. <laughs> well, that's free. That's free. Awesome. <laughs> Well, Daniel, I really like to thank you for your time today. It's always oh. nice when we have people that are on the front lines of making good change. You know, I'm lucky, you know. I could, I could be, I could be working at the restaurant down the street and not know that there's a there's a place for me to try and push push things forward. Well, special thanks to you and also to Sheila McCormick for uh, yes. <laughs> having a part in all of this. So both to get you to talk to us and it sounds like you have some academic history you know with her so if there are no other questions i just want to thank you and bravo for a great presentation do let us know when you're ready to go live <laughs> okay great well thank you very much for your time and the opportunity and i wish you all the best thank you bye-bye <laughs>